bankruptcy is virtually ubiquitous. It's not as ubiquitous as taxes. Everybody pays taxes. Almost everybody pays taxes. And it's not as ubiquitous, ubiquitous as death. Everybody dies. I'm sorry to say that. Um, but it's virtually ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Um, Detroit was in bankruptcy. Stockton, California was in bankruptcy. Harris, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania was in bankruptcy. Cedar Falls, Rhode Island was in bankruptcy. American Airlines was, was in bankruptcy, as was every legacy carrier out there. General Motors and Chrysler were in bankruptcy. Lehman Brothers was in bankruptcy, and which, I don't know if anybody's read Ben Bernanke's latest book, uh, that precipitated the worst economic sum since the Great Depression. Um, Energy Future Holdings is in bankruptcy, and you may not know the name, but that used to be TXU Energy. TXU Energy was bought in uh, 2007 by a bunch of hedge funds, among which is KKR, and um, they filed bankruptcy in Delaware in 2014. They filed bankruptcy in Delaware, notwithstanding the fact that all their assets are here in tax Texas. But besides the main debtor holding company, there were 71 affiliates and subsidiaries, and it's one of the largest cases in US history with $48 billion in debt. Um, it's the largest energy case ever filed, bigger than Enron, and um, it holds a company called, which is not in bankruptcy, called Encore Electric, and Encore Electric may be providing the utility service to your home. The hedge funds which bought it in 2007 leveraged it up with enormous amount of debt, and they did that on a bet. They were betting natural gas would go up. Natural gas, aided by the shale boom, didn't go up, it went down, and um, as a result, bankruptcy happened, and KKR is gonna get pennies on the dollar, but what they're not gonna get, they're not gonna get sued for their leverage buyout because of the good work that their um, bankruptcy lawyers did called Kirkland and Ellis in, in Chicago. They did a very, very well. They're, in, they're still in bankruptcy, but the, the plan's being confirmed this coming month. Bankruptcy is not like litigation. Bankruptcy, litigation is, is symmetric. There are people on both sides. They're fighting each other. Bankruptcy is asymmetric. Uh, there, it involves multiple players, um, each with their own agenda. Alliances are made, alliances are broken, war is declared, peace is declared. Sometimes you're in bed with one person and then you get out and you get in bed with another person to work the deal. Um, the bottom line is that you have to be aware of what's going on all the time because when the debtor at the end of the day receives his discharge or the plan is confirmed, you, whether or not you like the deal, whether or not you voted for the plan or agreed to his discharge, you're gonna get at the end of the day only what the court gives you. The Bankruptcy Code is a statutory framework. It has an internal consistency, but it's interpreted by 400 judges around the country. Uh, as a result, there are a lot of conflicting opinions a varied, uh, on a variety of issues depending on where you're located and the predilections of the judge. Judges are not machines. Judges have their own biases. They have their own um, experiences that shape their opinions. As a result, opinions, their written opinions, differ, and venue shopping and bankruptcy is rampant. Many of the largest cases are filed in New York and Delaware, which is why EFH filed in Delaware. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that, but what's clear is that the cases wouldn't be filed there unless the, the debtors and the debtors' bankruptcy lawyers thought that they could get what they wanted. Um, the bankruptcy code is divided into a bunch of chapters. Uh, chapter 7 is the formal li li uh, liquidation chapter. It's available to everyone except governmental entities. Chapter 9 is available to... There we go. Chapter 9 is available to municipalities such as Detroit, Stockton, California. Chapter 11 is the formal reorganization chapter. It's available to uh, individuals and entities, no matter how small or large. It's also the most expensive chapter to get into. Chapter 12 is available to family farmers and fishermen, believe it or not. Chapter 13 is a reorganization chapter for individuals who are wage earners. Chapter 15 is available for international debtors who have assets in the US that they want to protect. But in addition to being virtually ubiquitous, bankruptcy is also oxymoronic. Bankruptcy, despite the nomenclature, is expensive. In Chapter 11, you can expect the restructuring of the debtor's obligations to cost the debtor between 2 and 4% of its total assets. Um, one of the cases, the EFH case that I mentioned, there was a, a, an order by the bankruptcy court issued just the other day um, awarding the fees for one quarter from September to December 2014 to the various professionals. This is the chart. There are 30 professionals that the debtor has an obligation to pay. Kirkland and Ellis that I mentioned, for that one quarter work, three months, they got $28 million. So if anybody wants to see the chart, when I received it, I was like, 
wow. <laughs> um, another uh, indication of its oxymoronic um, posture preferences, which I'll discuss shortly, are not necessarily preferential. Fraudulent transfers are not necessarily fraudulent. And reorganization in Chapter 11 can't be achieved unless the court finds, that at the end of the day, that the plan is not likely to be followed by liquidation or further financial reorganization. Yet there are informal chapters, not on this list, there are informal chapters that contemplate exactly that. Chapter 14 is back-to-back -back sevens, although you can't follow seven as a, um, uh, more than eight years. Chapter 20 is an individual's chapter seven followed by a, a 13. Chapter 22 consists of sequentially filed chapter 11s. And 20 to 33% of all reorganizations have to file a second chapter 11. There have, in fact, been 240 of them. Chapter 26 are back-to-back -back chapter 13s. And there have been several chapter 33s Chapter 11 filed three times. TWA is among those. Chapter 44, Trans-Texas Trans -Texas Gas Corporation filed bankruptcy four times. Donald Trump's casino companies with the filing of its most recent uh, Atlantic City Hotel. His companies have filed bankruptcy four times. And then there's one Chapter 55, a, a company out of New Jersey called Strauss Auto Discount. Um, anyway, so bankruptcy has been filed. The debtor has to file its schedules and its statement of financial affairs under penalty of perjury, um, listing all of its assets and debts, its uh, lit all litigation, all threatened litigation, all equity or other interests that it, ha that it holds. And the failure to be truthful can um, be significant. It's, uh, you can have the case dismissed and prosecution for um, under criminal penalties, five years or half a million dollars or both. Once bankruptcy is filed, there's a 341 meeting of creditors. Um, it's called 341 because that's the code section under which uh, the meeting occurs. And that meeting is a, an opportunity for any of the creditors to ask the debtor anything about their assets and liabilities. In a Chapter 7 or 13 case, a trustee is appointed. A trustee is elected by creditors in a Chapter 7 case. Um, in Chapter 11, the Office of the U.S. Trustee, of which we have a member back in the back, um, uh, manages the meeting of creditors, and regardless of the debtor's perceived prior ma mismanagement, it's difficult to get um, a debtor in possession managing the case out. It's difficult to get a Chapter 11 trustee mm -hmm. appointed, but it can be done on a post-petition basis. Chapter 7 and 11 are the primary engines of bankruptcy, but, they for, but these serve fundamentally different purposes. Uh, chapter 7 is a liquidation of assets and a distribution. The, the trustee is appointed. He liquidates the assets, marshals the assets, liquidates them, and distributes those, uh, those assets to the creditors of the estate. The liabilities don't go away. They are simply not enforceable against the debtor going forward. That's Im important for you to keep in mind. The liabilities are still there. You simply can't enforce them against the debtor. Chapter 11 is the reorganization chapter, and it's designed fundamentally to restructure the, a, a company's obligations. But a Chapter 11 reorganization can also provide for a liquidation of the assets. Um, unlike Chapter 7 cases where a trustee is appointed to oversee the liquidation, like I said, a Chapter 11, the debtor in possession generally remains in control. Oops. Um, there's no insolvency requirement to file Chapter 7 or Chapter 11, and neither Chapter 7 nor, nor 11 have debt ceiling limitations, income requirements, or otherwise restrict the eligibility to a certain class of persons. With narrow exceptions, Chapter 7 and 11 are available to everybody, um, except governmental units. In a Chapter 7 case, the, the Office of the United States Trustee, a division of the Department of Justice, appoints an interim Chapter 7 trustee when the case is filed. Unsecured creditors have the right to elect a different trustee. The trustee is authorized to hire counsel and other professionals whose fees and costs are, are paid by the assets of the bankruptcy estate. A Chapter 7 trustee is author, author, authorized with approval of the court to operate the debtor's business in rare circumstances. Chapter 11s are a little bit different. In a typical Chapter 11 case, the debtor is considered a fiduciary of the bankruptcy estate, remains in possession and control of the assets and affairs, generally has all the rights and powers of a trustee with a few important exceptions. Um, a Chapter 11 debtor has no uh, duty to liquidate the assets of the estate, although they can, um, and a debtor in possession will operate the business in the ordinary co course, and in extraordinary situations, they have to go to the uh, bankruptcy court to get permission. The Unsecured Creditors Committee in many Chapter 11 cases is appointed by the, by the U.S. trustee. 
um, if there is interest by the creditors in the case. Uh, in larger cases, additional committees may be formed, equity committees, retiree committees, bond committees, asbestos claimants committees, depending on the kind of case you've got. The creditors committee and any committees appointed have standing to propose and be heard on their own plan if the debtor's exclusivity period expires, which is 120 days to file a plan, 180 days to get it confirmed unless that is extended by the court. Um, in any event, under the new rules, you have to get a plan filed and confirmed within 20 months from the petition date. The committee is authorized to uh, investigate and um, the financial status of the debtor and uh, to request the appointment of a trustee or examiner in the, in the appropriate case. Property of the bankruptcy estate. Um, the, the commencement of the case creates an estate. It is not the debtor. It's a distinct legal entity that can sue and be sued but it's not the debtor. Um, determining the scope and extent of the bankruptcy estate's property may sig be significant because the imposition of the automatic stay, which I'll talk in about in a minute, only affects estate property. Property of the debtor's estate is defined very broadly. Property includes all legal and equitable, equitable interests of the debtor as of the filing of the petition. That includes, and this is a quote from a Seventh Circuit case, every conceivable interest of the debtor, future, non-contingent, contingent, speculative, or derivative. The automatic stay operates as a stay of the commencement or continuation of any proceeding that affects the debtor or property of the debtor. A violation of the automatic stay, it comes into effect immediately, whether you know about the bankruptcy or not, immediately upon the filing of the case. A violation of the stay not only voids whatever action you've taken post-filing, post-petition, but you all also may be liable for actual damages in the event you take vi uh, some action in violation of the stay. If you had actual knowledge of the bankruptcy case and you took some action in violation of the stay anyway, you could be liable for punitive damages as well. The automatic stay also pr serves to protect creditors of the debtor by preventing a race to the courthouse and by permitting an equitable distribution of the estate's assets to all creditors. The automatic stay contains exceptions for certain specific types of action. For example, it doesn't um, stay the continuation of pr criminal proceedings. It doesn't stay actions by a government entity in its police and regulatory power. The automatic stay protects only the debtor and doesn't extend to entities that the debtor, um, corporate affiliates of the debtor, partners of a debtor's bankruptcy, or co-defendants in, in pending litigation. Um, the actions brought against the debtor are normally out of, well, allowed to proceed against those people, against co-tort feasors or joint obligors or guarantors or sureties. You can still proceed against those entities. Courts have held, however, that the automatic stay can reach beyond the debtor in certain circumstances, such as officers, directors, and others. But because the automatic stay only applies to actions against the debtors, actions brought by the debtor are not stayed. That's an important distinction. So here's a scenario. You represent a bank. You hold a note on a commercial building, LLC, which owns the building, goes into bankruptcy. The note, the deed of trust, the building, the cause of action, the debtor filed against you for lender liability. All of that is property of the estate. You are stayed from taking any action against the debtor to foreclose on that note. As a secured creditor, you have the option to simply ride out the bankruptcy. The secured creditor's security interest is generally not affected by the bankruptcy. The debtor has the debtor has, uh, for all intents and purposes, disappeared. It's an LLC, but in its place is a debtor in possession. Your contract rates against the previous entity, for the time being, without court approval, are effectively worthless. You have a claim for money against the debtor. That still exists, but you can't enforce it. Although companies don't get discharges, an individual does get a discharge. The secured creditor, although perhaps delayed from actually enforcing its lien, will eventually collect its money as long as there's sufficient equity in the property. And there's the rub, whether there's enough equity in the property. Um, there's an axiomatic rule in bankruptcy. The secured creditor is only secured to the extent of the value of its interest in the property of the estate. But note that, like I said before, that the automatic stay only stays actions against the debtor or against property of the debtor. If the debtor has a lender liability action against you, the debtor can still proceed with that action. So in order to salvage that, you've got to ask the court to, 
to lift the stay so that you can defend yourself against this lender liability action and, or foreclose on the property. Important to remember, you, if you get a, a deposition notice or something like that from the debtor, even the debtor has filed, after the debtor has filed bankruptcy, you have to comply. So um, termination of the automatic stay or modification of the automatic stay is, un is undertaken for good cause, including uh, there are certain definitions, but good cause can be anything. Lack of adequate protection for you, the creditor, or if the debtor has no equity in the property and it's not effective to a re reorganization, you can get the stay lifted. Um, executory contracts authorize, the bankruptcy code authorizes the debtor in possession or trustee to assume and assign executory contracts on unexpired leases, provided certain requirements are met. The executory, the term executory contract is not defined, but um, it essentially means that there are obligations on both sides, where the failure of one obligation will create an ob a, a, a liability on the other side. Uh, when performance is due on both sides, the contract is ex executory. Debtors are permitted, with certain exceptions, to assume and assign contracts um, to third parties regardless of any prohibition in the contract or lease and over the objection of the non-debtor party. Um, however, those contracts can't be assumed or assigned if applicable non-bankruptcy law would excuse the non-debtor party from accepting performance or rendering performance, personal service contracts, patents, Certain governmental contracts fall within the group of contracts that can't be assigned without consent. The assumption provisions allow a debtor to cure defaults and retain profitable contracts that might otherwise be terminated. Similarly, the debtor is, uh, has a, an ability to freely assign valuable contracts to maximize the value of this, the estate's assets. If you have a contract that says the filing of bankruptcy is an event of default, forget it. It's not. In bankruptcy, those ipso facto clauses, if you file bankruptcy, this results are not enforceable. As a condition to the assumption or assignment of a contract or lease, the debtor has to cure or provide adequate assurance of a prompt cure, compensate the non-debtor party for actual pecuniary loss, provide uh, adequate assurance of the, of the future performance under the contract or lease, and keep in mind only the entire contract or lease can be assumed or assigned, both the benefits and the burdens. The debtor is not permitted to pick and choose aspects of the contract that can be assumed and assigned, but reality is always different. Um, more than likely, the debtor would come to you and say, we're going to reject the contract unless you modify it, um, and so you end up modifying the contract, and that's, then the debtor assumes the contract going forward. A debtor can also choose to reject an ex executor contract, and upon rejection, the contract is deemed rejected as of the filing date. So if the rejection happens a year after the bankruptcy is deemed rejected as of the filing date, you have an unsecured claim against the estate for your damages. Uh, in the context of, uh, of a lease, those damages are capped. Um, and uh, if, you, if there is a rejection of your contract during the course of the, of the bankruptcy and then it's su subsequently assumed, then you have an administrative claim for the, the, your, your damages associated with the rejection. Set off and recoupment. Set off and recoupment allows parties to offset obligations one owes to the other. It's important to exercise those rights in a bankruptcy proceeding because they're performed in real dollars. Usually in a, thank you, usually in a bankruptcy case, um, when you get, let's assume that you have a claim in bankruptcy, your claim at the end of the day is allowed in full, but the debtor's only paying 10 cents on the dollar. So your claim, though your $100,000 claim is allowed in full, you're only get, gonna get 10% of that claim paid to you. The rest is unenforceable as against the debtor. So notwithstanding that it's allowed, you get paid in what everybody calls bankruptcy dollars, 10 cents on the dollar or 15 cents on the dollar. Set off and recoupment allows you to get paid in real dollars, um, your dollars, the pre-petition dollars. By paying the, um, by, by paying its pre-petition debt to the debtor without invoking a right to set off, the creditor risks losing its right to set off altogether because the claims upon which the creditor set off rights are based are no longer enforceable because of the automatic stay. There's no statutory right in the bankruptcy code to, code to set off. Um, it just preserves your set off rights under non-bankruptcy law. Um, 
in order to establish a valid right of set off, the party's obligations have to arise prior to the commencement of the bankruptcy and must be mutual. Mutuality is not defined in the code. Um, it just means between the same parties who are, are also standing in the same capacity. It's not necessarily to show, not necessarily to show that the debts arose out of the same transaction. Um, the code addresses only pre-petition setoffs. Post-petition claims can be set off post-petition as well um, under other sections of the code, but the court or the creditor must first re obtain relief from the stay. The right of recoupment is similar to set off, except that debts capable of re recruitment must arise out of the same <coughs> transaction or occurrence. There is also reclamation. The Bankruptcy Code preserves a seller's reclamation rights under non-bankruptcy law, UCC-2-702, uh, usually, by granting the seller the right to reclaim goods of an insolvent debtor, sold to an insolvent debtor in the ordinary course of the se seller's business if the debtor receives goods within 45 days of the filing. The goods have to be in the buyer's possession. They have to be identified. They're subject to rights uh, of any ordinary course or good faith purchaser. And to activate the, the reclamation rights, you as the seller have to make a written demand on the debtor not later than 20 days after the commencement of the bankruptcy case. Goods delivered within that 20-day period have an automatic administrative claim associated with them. And even if the seller fails to provide the, the 20 days notice, it may still assert the, an administrative claim for the value of those goods. Sale of assets. A Chapter 11 debtor is permitted to operate the debtor's business in the ordinary course and may use, sell, or lease assets as it needs to. If it's questionable as to whether the, the debtor is operating in the ordinary course, the debtor can go to the court and ask permission to sell out of the, um, in the, those extraordinary circumstances. The code authorizes the debtor to use or sell assets outside the ordinary course through a confirmed plan or court order under section 363 of the code. Um, for example, a trustee or debtor may not only sell uh, the estate's interest in property, but the interest of non-consenting co-owners if partition of the property is impractical or if the benefit of the estate outweighs the detriment to co-owners. Depending on the jurisdiction, a debtor may even undertake a Chapter 11 to solely sell its assets and then dismiss the case. It's called a structured dismissal, and there's case law out there that, that uh, mostly in the Third Circuit that approves such a, uh, a procedure. The appointment of a Chapter 11 trustee is rare and usually requires malfeasance on the part of the debtor. The standard for appointing such a trustee is, again, cause, which is, is defined to include fraud, dishonesty, incompetence, mismanage, gross mismanagement. Um, there's a very strong presum presumption, as I said initially, that the debtor in possession should remain in, in place. A, a Chapter 11 debtor in possession may convert the case to a Chapter 7 if a Chapter 11 trustee hasn't been appointed. The case was not originally commenced as an involuntary one. On request of any party, the court may also convert the case to one under Chapter 7, again, for cause. Uh, the Bankruptcy Code provides 10 non-exclusive reasons for appointment of such or for, for dismissal or conversion of the case, which is a continuing loss or dim diminution to the estate, inability to affect a Chapter 11 plan, inordinate delay, etc. Avoidance actions. Most companies experience bankruptcy um, in the context of preferences or, avoidance or, or fraudulent transfer claims, collectively referred to as avoidance actions. The rights of debtors to avoid, meaning to claw back, fraudulent and preferential transfers is one of the fundament, fundamental policies of bankruptcy policy. Fraudulent transfer law is one of the oldest forms of, of protection tracing its roots back to 1571. Like its antecedents, fraudulent transfers, um, which mean any conveyance or transfer that was made with the intent to, and I'll quote from the Statue of Elizabeth in 1571, to delay, hinder, or defraud creditors and others of their just and lawful actions. Those things are deemed vo void. In contrast, preference laws um, are relatively new. Avoidance, in, like I said, avoidance in the context of um, uh, avoidance uh, procedures means to recover the assets back for the benefit of the bankruptcy estate. The bankruptcy code allows the avoidance of a transfer that is avoidable under both state and federal law. Fraudulent transfer statutes in Texas go back four years. 
Um, the IRS has a fraudulent transfer statute that goes back 10 years. Um, all states have some form, form of uh, fraudulent transfer law, and um, the, whether it's larger or smaller than four years, it depends on the, on, on the particular state. Fraudulent transfers, despite the, the word fraudulent, are not, like I said earlier, are not necessarily fraudulent. They're defined as transfers by the debtor prior to the commencement of the case that are either made with the actual intent to hinder, delay, or defraud. But keep in mind, it's just hinder, delay, or defraud. You don't necessarily have to defraud somebody to be accused of a fraudulent transfer if you hindered or delayed their um, contractual or, or statutory rights. Or made with, in exchange, for less than reason reasonably equivalent value, this is called constructive fraudulent transfer, while the debtor was insolvent or which rendered the debtor insolvent or which left the debtor with inadequate capital. Just as fraudulent transfers don't have to be fr fraudulent, preferences don't have to be pre preferential. Preferences are transfers made by the debtor within 90 days before the commencement of the case or one year if the transferee was an insider. That results in the debtor getting more than it would have received when compared with similarly situated creditors. The intent and knowledge of the parties is irrelevant. Um, the analysis focuses on whether the creditor's position was changed or improved as a result of the payment. So bankruptcy's filed you out a ton of money, just another hypothetical, because the debtor paid you, I don't know, $100,000 but sat on its biggest payable, let's say it's a million dollars they owe you. The debtor owes you a million dollars, and let's assume, you know, this is a stupid example, but let's assume you have no collateral, no letter of credit, no, no guarantee, um, or you have a guarantee, but it's worthless, um, and you're out $900,000. Eventually, you get over it, you move on, and two years later, you receive a letter from the debtor's counsel saying, by the way, that $100,000 you received from us, you know, within the 90 days, or if it's an insider within one year of filing, give it back. And you're lo you look at the letter and you say, are you kidding me? I'm not going to do that. That's stupid. So they sue you. And depending on, on what, whether you have a defense, you, they may ha you may have to pay it back. And if you pay it back, you have a claim that you can make for that $100,000. But again, you're going to get paid in bankruptcy dollars, not real dollars. Preference law used to be based on the logical precept that you couldn't prefer friends and families over those that you didn't know, even if you owe them money. So protect, to protect against that, a fiction was created that says essentially that we're going to pretend the bankruptcy started 90 days before it actually started and payments made that during that 90 day period of time have to be paid back. And the fact that your defaulting debtor is suing you for money that, you previously, that they previously owed you and paid you makes preferences egregious, really unfair from the point of view of the creditor. But it's not the pre-petition debtor that's suing you, it's the estate. But regardless of who files a preference action against you, whether it's the bankruptcy state or the trustee, preference litiga litigation is really about, is a fight between you and the, and the other creditors of the, of the case. Because a, a bankruptcy estate is essentially a pool of money. And everybody is jockeying for their little share of that pool of money. And if they pay you more, they pay others less. If they pay others more, they pay you less. The shareholders when bankruptcy is filed, really don't own the company in a real sense any longer, and they're typically out of the money anyway. The debtor's gone, perhaps as a salaried management role. Secured creditors generally rely on their collateral. The bankruptcy process as a whole is geared to protect the unsecured creditors of the estate, and that's why preference came into being. And I, I'm told I'm out of time, and I have a few more slides, but we'll, uh, we'll defer that. Um, 